Hi, my name is Neil Blevins, and this is a talk about my method for texturing hard surface models, the 2016 edition. So for those of you who've been following along, this is actually the fourth um, video in the series. And uh, back in 2009, I did a Noman DVD, and I showed my technique for uh, texturing this robot here, uh, the Mortuary robot. And uh, then about five years later, um, technology had improved in a lot of ways. We had a lot of new software and plugins for 3ds Max. And so I did a new version, uh, which was uh, texturing this robot hand for the Ink book project. And it was the same basic method, the same basic technique, but the difference was uh, we had better software. And about a year later, we got even uh, more software that was helpful in this uh, process. And so I did another version of it, uh, and this one was a sci-fi power cell. And then here we are now in 2016, and uh, Max 2017.1 just got released, and inside is a brand new blended box map and also uh, some brand new curvature. And so it seemed to make sense it was time to do uh, the fourth version of this. Uh, showing off uh, these new uh, pieces of software uh, inside of uh, uh, using this particular technique. So uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be texturing this uh, Iron Man mask here. And uh, I did not model this. Uh, this was modeled by, um, I hope I get his name right, uh, it is Romain Chaliac. Um, he's in France, so I think that's how you pronounce his name. And he was really, really nice enough to let me use this model for this tutorial. And this is his uh, Gumroad right here, um, in, uh, it's uh, WZX, and this was one of his tutorials that he did, Making the Hulkbuster, where he goes through uh, modeling and his version of shading uh, this uh, Hulkbuster model. And this is a really interesting tutorial. I highly recommend um, buying a copy of this. I found it certainly uh, really interesting to watch. And so I asked him if I could use just the head for my tutorial, and he said yes. So thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. And let's go back here. So this is uh, what I'm starting with. And then this here is some reference images of what I was going to do. So rather than doing an identical Hulkbuster image, I decided I would do one of the other Iron Man characters. Um, I think it was the third Iron Man film where he made a bunch of like extra Iron Mans, uh, which all had different colors and slightly different shapes and whatnot. And this is one of them. And I thought it was uh, kind of cool. Um, these are pictures from a, uh, a toy. Um, of the model. So I went ahead and I did my own version of him um, based on the, uh, the original model. So using all the same techniques that uh, I did for those other guys uh, just now on the, the new model. And this video is going to be showing how I went about uh, producing this. Okay, so here we are inside of 3D Studio Max 2017.1 and uh, this is uh, Romal's model right here. And um, the standard way that you would texture a model like this really kind of depends on what kind of job you're doing. So if you're doing 3D concept design, uh, the most common method is to transfer your model to a program like Keyshot, uh, applying some simple materials and lights, and then bringing it into Photoshop to paint the dirt and grime and details in 2D. And this technique is certainly fine, produces um, some good results, but if you need to change angles on your object or you need to render out um, several angles to show off your design, you don't have to repaint all that dirt. Uh, now, if you're on the uh, production side of things, producing the final asset for a game or a film, the most common workflow is to UV all your objects and then bring them into a 3D paint program and manually paint all the pieces. And um, there are plenty of disadvantages with this technique. First is if you want to change a major thing like the texture you're using for your metal, this is more complex because you have a lot of different textures on every piece of your model. And second, you have to UV every single piece, uh, every single object in your model. And that can take a lot of time, especially if you have hundreds of objects. Like uh, for a recent project, I had one model that was 1,500 objects, and the idea of trying to UV all that just uh, seemed really daunting. So we all hate UVing stuff, and so the focus on uh, my texturing is about how to uh, texture complex models using techniques that are UV independent, so you don't have to set up UVs. So the technique I'm showing in this video is projection-based, and it lets you texture an object in full 3D without the need to UV anything, and it saves a lot of time regardless of whether you're making a full production model or doing a 3D concept design. Okay, so step one is setting up the environment. So um, I'm using 3ds Max 2017.1. Uh, uh, I'm also using V-Ray as my renderer, um, and you can uh, do this with other renderers. You don't have to use V-Ray, uh, but I've set up all my stuff to work inside of V-Ray because that's the main renderer that I use. So uh, the next thing you'll need once you have those two pieces of software is 
you'll need to go to the Soulburn Scripts for 3DS Max page, which is on my website. Just go to neilblevins.com, go to CG Tools, and you'll find this. And this is a series of uh, scripts that I wrote. Um, so download the, uh, the pack here, whatever the most recent one is, whenever you see this video, and install these, and uh, we'll be using those. And then on top of that, um, download this asset pack, which is also in the CG tool section of neilblevins.com. And what this is, is this is a whole pack of various materials. And you go down here and you download this here, and you also download the texture pack, which are all the textures needed for these. And these are going to be uh, what we're gonna be using to uh, texture the, uh, the robot. Um, and um, uh, again, these are using V-Ray. So if you uh, don't use V-Ray as your renderer, then you'll need to make these on your own. But if you're using V-Ray, then you can use these prefab ones that I made. Okay, so back in Max, here's our model. Uh, it has 46 several, uh, separate pieces, which uh, isn't too bad um, compared to some of the crazy ones I've worked on that have thousands of pieces. But still, the idea of going about and UVing all these pieces, UVing is just the most boring thing in the universe. I really don't want to do it. So let's not do it. Instead, we shall use this technique. So the first step um, is that right now, um, this is just a editable poly. Uh, but I would like to smooth this out using Open Subdiv. And so I have the script here um, called Open Subdiv Automator. And what this lets you do is I hit Apply. And at render time, when you hit Render, it will quickly take all the objects in your scene. It'll apply an Open Subdiv. It'll render, and then it'll take that Open Subdiv off your model. And um, the advantage of using this technique is, as opposed to just putting an open subdiv in the modifier stack, is you now don't have to worry about having this open subdiv in here and working underneath it and constantly switching in the modifier stack. It just happens at render time. So it's a real quick way to go about doing uh, render time subdivisions. So I just set that. So next time I render, it'll quickly throw the open subdiv on with render iterations of two. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a light rig to this scene, and I'm going to use this piece of software called Sal that I wrote. So it'll take a second for this to come up. So what Sal is, um, it's kind of a key shot like interface. Uh, and the idea is, is that up here are environments, and if I click on any of these, this environment will show up in the scene. If I click on any of these, it'll take these materials and apply them to your objects. And if you, uh, these are um, models that I just uh, bring in, like a bunch of primitives and other things that uh, are um, uh, good to have uh, from building other models. So in this case, uh, we're not going to use the model one, so I'll just get rid of that. And um, this is part of the Soulburn pack, and if you want to, you can go and uh, to my YouTube channel, and there's a whole tutorial on how to use this and how to set this up. So feel free to look at that if you haven't tried this before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, the following environment right here, which is just a very simple, generic, hard surface texturing rig. So I click it once, and now in my scene is that uh, lighting setup. So next we're going to prepare the model, and that is using the model preparer script from the Soulbird pack. And so I'm going to select all the objects, and what this is going to do is this is going to do a whole series of uh, things to the model to prepare it for um, um, this system. Uh, first of all is convert base objects to editable poly. Uh, in this case, I don't need to do it. It's sometimes nice to do this just to clean up your model, but um, we don't need it for this case, so I'm going to turn that off. Set all material IDs to 1. This is helpful if it turns out that you have a bunch of different material IDs on your surface. I don't, so I'll just turn that off. Reset X form, this is also unnecessary now. This is, uh, was necessary for some of the older techniques, but now you don't have to do it anymore. Still could be helpful, you know, so uh, you know, I'll just leave this on. There's no reason not to have it there. Uh, link selected models to a point helper. That just makes it easier um, to, you have a point helper, which all these are attached to, and it makes it easier to move around. Then it's going to bake curvature on this uh, using the new data channel modifier, which is the modifier uh, that exists inside of 2017.1. Uh, uh, I'll show you what we're going to do with the curvature, but for now, I just leave those as default. And then prep uh, for a blended cube projection. What this is going to do is this is going to use the new Max's blended box map, and it's going to render out uh, a bunch of templates uh, that we're going to be painting on later on. So um, I'll just set that to 512, but you can set that to any size you want. And hit apply. And it goes about preparing the model. And here what it's doing is it's rendering out those templates uh, inside of the uh, V-Ray frame buffer. 
So I'm just going to stop the video while it renders out these, uh, these templates, and I'll be right back once it's finished. Okay, so we're back, and when the process is finished, it'll pop open a little dialog here saying the model has been prepared, just to let you know that the process is done. So hit OK, and then I'll show you these uh, templates that are rendered out. So what it did was it rendered six templates from six different sides of the model. So it, here's a top, here's a left, right, front, uh, back, and then bottom, I believe. So we're going to be painting on these later on, and I'll show you that process. But the uh, model prepare script uh, starts off by making these for you um, as part of the preparation state. Okay, so we're back inside of Max, and uh, one little thing I wanted to show you before we move on is what, um, if you haven't read about what a blended box map or a blended cube projection is, feel free to go to my website, and there's more tutorials about it. But I'll give you a really quick primer here. Let's say that we attach uh, this material, and I will put on a blended box map, and I will set it to a value of 6, so it's projecting from 6 different sides, and then I will turn this on here so that we can see the final result on our object. Okay, there we go. Now, what this is doing is this is projecting uh, six different directions, six different bitmaps from six different directions onto the surface. So in this case, um, these are just test colors, but the front is getting a pink color, the top is getting a blue color, the side is getting a, um, the left is getting a green color, and then what it's doing is, is it's blending between these. So if I take this blend amount and I take it to zero, you can see that there's no longer any blending going on. And if you were to project uh, textures like this, you'll end up getting these hard edge seams at these edges, and you don't want that. So that's why this thing gets blended like that. That's too much blending. And then somewhere in the middle here is sort of a, a good amount, maybe about 20 or so. So that's what's going to let us um, paint these different textures, project them onto the surface, and then have it so that there's no nasty seams uh, between those edges. Okay, so let's start getting some real materials on this thing. So I'm just going to hide lights, cameras, and helpers for now. And I will select this whole guy. And we're going to be applying uh, the materials using Sal. So I'll go over to Sal here, bring up the interface again. And what I'm going to start off with is I'm going to apply uh, this metal steel worn to the entire surface. Then just in a few spots, I'm going to add some, some darker metal. So maybe like there and there, maybe like the, the top area. So here is uh, steel worn 2, which is a bit darker. Then for these back parts here, I'm going to add a painted metal. So I'll just add those to there. And um, for the painted metal, uh, this one here, the, the combo dirty, rusty, decaled, painted, worn metal B. I know it's a long name. Okay, so that's applied. And then lastly, for the eyes, since uh, we're going to have glowing eyes, I'll just apply this uh, simple light bulb shader. Okay, pull this out of here. And let me just grab some of these materials in here. So. Throw that one there, and then here's the combo material, steel worn material, steel worn two. Okay, so we can modify these uh, after the fact. Okay, now the next thing we need to do is uh, this material in particular requires um, uh, us to hook ourselves up to the modifier which created uh, the uh, blended cube projection. So again, I'll select all the objects. And what I'll do is I'll go into this one here. This is the Blended Cube Projection Manager. And let me unhide these helpers. Um, what, when I did the model prepare, it created this helper object here. And this helper object, um, I will pick here under Projection Box. And so that Projection Box has now been picked inside of the script. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select um, maps on selected objects. So what this is going to do is it's going to go through and every map that's assigned to the selected object, it's going to hook this projection box up to that map. And so this material, this material, this material, any uh, material in here that requires a projection box, it's going to, going to apply this. So I'll hit apply. And now that's done. And you'll see in a minute uh, why you need to do this step. Okay, so let's start uh, off doing just a simple test render of what we have so far. And 
there we go. So right off the bat, it's got you know at least uh, some sort of textures going on. Uh, and this one here, the painted one back here, is this guy here. It has a bunch of default stuff in here. So we're going to go in and now start editing these textures to, uh, to make them look better. OK, so first we're going to work on this painted material back here. And um, this is the material layer that applies that. And inside here, there's a blend material, and then there's a bump material. And all this does is it takes a bump, which is sort of an overall large bump on the surface, and applies it to all the submaterials inside of here. So let's go inside here, where we have the submaterials. And what this is, this is a stack of a bunch of materials sitting on top of each other. So we have a steel-worn material, then we have a steel-worn two sitting on top of it and then a paint material on top of it, a decal material, a rust material, a dirt material, and a dust material. Now, if I'm doing a full model, I'll use all these separate materials, but for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm just going to get rid of a few of these uh, because we don't need uh, all of them. So I'm just going to get rid of this dust material, and I'll get rid of the Steel Worn 2, and I'm going to get rid of the decal. Here we go, and uh, maybe I'll just condense this a little bit. Okay. Okay, so now it's just metal, paint, rust, and dirt. And now the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this rust, I'm just going to drag this down here, and this rust mask. Then I'm going to take the dirt, do the same thing. And what I want to do is I want to take the, this rust and dirt and also apply it to these metal materials. So the, this first metal material here, remember this metal is assigned to these objects. I will go and I'll drag the rust in and the dirt in. And then I'll do the same thing for its neighbor over here. Okay, now I'll go back here, and for the moment, I'm just going to turn down uh, some of these other layers. So I'm basically going to turn off the rust and the dirt for now, and we're just going to worry about the, uh, the paint layer. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the diffuse color of the paint layer, and uh, down here there's a bunch of stuff added into each other, but if you go down to the color layer, this is the main layer which lets you adjust the color of what the, the paint is going to look like. So you, whatever you adjust this to is what the, the paint color is for the most part. And um, I went ahead and um, I know that these values give the right blue color for the mask. OK, and now let us render this again. There we go. And I just noticed I forgot to turn down also the, the dirt and the rust here. Let me just uh, go do that. So I'll turn these to zero as well for now. And we can re-render. OK, so we've got the right color going on here. And uh, the other thing I noticed is that the, the, the bump which is going on on the surface here seems to be a little large. Uh, not the, uh, the strength of the bump, but the size of the, uh, the bump map. So what I'm going to do, I'll just cancel this render, is I'm going to reduce the, the, the size of the um, blended box maps that are in here. So if you go inside of here and go into the, um, the bump map down here, you can see the bump map is a V-Ray triplanar texture, which is identical to the blended box map. It's just the V-Ray version of it, which has uh, a, a few different features. And here's the scale of it, um, 0 0.01. So I'm going to increase the size of this. Uh, if you cr increase the scale, what it actually does is it makes the uh, bitmaps that are being applied here smaller. But instead of doing it inside of here, there's actually like four or five of these triplanars inside of here. So I'm going to show another one of my scripts, which is the blended box map manager. And what I can do in here is this takes every single thing in the active material slot 
Uh, so any um, uh, triplaners it finds or blended box maps it finds and it will uh, do whatever the operation is to all these things. So I will say do scale. I'll set this to 0 0.03 and then I'll hit apply. And now that has done this to every single one of these, not just this one, but all of them in this material. And now I'll do the same for this material here. Okay. And so now when I hit render on this, we can see that it's changed all of the uh, bitmaps that are in here. Now one other thing it's done is now this uh, is looking far more crinkly as opposed to uh, being smooth and it's good to have some of that crinkle in there but um, not that much. So in this case what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into here and go up to the top and remember how I said there was this bump map being applied to everything. I'm going to take down the strength of that bump map from 15 down to, I don't know, maybe 7. I do the same up here. See what that looks like. Yeah, I think that's looking uh, looking much better. Okay, so now let's worry about the edge wear on these surfaces. And one thing you'll notice if you look at photographs of uh, real objects where there's paint on a metal surface, anywhere where you have an edge, like around here or here, you'll get these little chipped pieces of paint. And that's an effect that really adds a lot of realism to a surface. And again, a lot of people will paint that in manually, but uh, I prefer using a procedural uh, method of doing it because that way I can do it to the entire surface uh, instantly without having to manually paint all those. So let's go into our paint surface and we're gonna go into the mask. And so what this does is anywhere where this mask is black is gonna reveal the, the metal and anywhere this mask is white is going to reveal the paint. So if I go into here, there's two different layers. There's a specific and a general layer. And I'm just going to turn off the specific one for a second. So we just have the general one. And uh, we'll see what that does. Okay, so you can see all those scratches went away. But now we want these chipped paint parts around these edges. And so let's stop that. So the way we do that is that curvature thing that you saw before. So let's go into here and we'll select all the pieces and we'll go into the modifier stack. And this is the new uh, data channel in Max 2017.1. And this is creating curvature. And if we go down to the bottom here, yeah, let me select the curvature. Uh, the only thing you really need to change here is potentially the scale value. So as you decrease the scale value and you can see the results happening in here, it picks up less and less of the edges. And as you increase this, it picks up more and more of the edges. And um, in the earlier version I did, I found that a, a value of about 17 was, was pretty good as far as getting all the, the right edges. Um, but you know, play with this until you get whatever results seem to work best for you. Now let's go into this general um, uh, thing down here. Again, it's inside of the, the mask, the paint mask. And this is going to take this curvature that's inside of here and it's going to apply noise to it and then it's going to use that to chip off this paint. And so uh, the first step is you go into your noise and you can play around with these values. Um, I found that uh, you know, it really depends on the, the size you're looking for, uh, the size of your, your object. So in this particular case, I think I'm going to take the size down a little bit from the defaults. And what we're going to do is we're going to see what the results are of just this. Like you see in the viewport, it won't show you what the results are of here. It'll only show you what the results are of this modifier. So I'm going to use another script of mine um, called text map preview. And what this script does is it'll take whatever is inside of your material editor, just this map, and it'll apply to the entire surface and render a really quick version of it so that you can see uh, what it's going to look like. So. For example, if I run it here, it's showing me just this noise. Or if I go up here and I go down to this level, this gradient ramp here, which is what's grabbing the curvature, and I hit apply, it'll render out just that curvature. So that's what that curvature looks like. So in this case, uh, we have our curvature here, then under here, this what this does is this sort of clamps the curvature a little bit. Let me um, show you what the results are of that. 
So that just put, adds a little bit of contrast. And then if we go up to this higher level uh, inside of this noise, um, let's actually just change these a little bit. Let's, uh, this is the high and low clamp. So let's make that a little bit, the noise a little bit harsher. Now let's see what this level does. So what this level does is it takes this and then mixes it with that noise, which you can see there. And then here is this output map down at the bottom of this map. And if we turn this off, you can see what that's doing. So that's doing the noise mixed with the curvature, but then when we turn this on, it is clamping it to make it more contrasty. But I think we need even more contrast than this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push this up really high, like uh, maybe uh, 96 and then 95. And so what that should do is that should make this uh, even more, larger chunks of black. Yeah, you can see the, the black is getting much larger there. So if we move this down here, it'll be more uh, white. And if we move it up here, it'll be more black. And the black areas are the parts where it's going to chip off the paint. So uh, let's see. Maybe, maybe increase this a little tiny bit. Maybe um, see what that result is. Just trying to get a little more black here. Yeah, that helps out a little. Okay, so that map is our mask. And again, the black areas will reveal the metal and the white areas will reveal the paint. So now we can do a full render and we can see what the results of that are. There you go. So you now you can see, we're starting to see little bits of those edges uh, come off revealing the paint underneath. And maybe let's go back into here and change that noise a little bit. Maybe make the noise bigger, maybe uh, clamp it a little bit more, maybe do this. Yeah, start re-rendering re again. There we go, that's really starting to, to come together now. So anyway, so that is a quick way, once you have these parameters, if you assign this material to any set of objects, it'll do this uh, paint chipping off and you didn't have to manually paint that, which is a huge bonus. There, that just gives a little bit more uh, spaces in between. Okay, now that we have all the procedural stuff set up, let's start going in and adding the painted details uh, using our blended cube projection. So what we're going to do, um, first thing is we'll start off with the paint and we're going to go up here and we're going to turn back on this specific layer. So the general layer down here did the like paint chips, but the specific layer is going to be the painting that we're going to do inside of Photoshop. So let's go in here and inside of here you can see there is a uh, blended box map and this is set to six projections and it's got bitmaps in here to project from all six different directions. And if you go in here right now, you can see that these uh, bitmaps are just a, a test paint mask. And that's what those scratches were before. So what we're going to do, though, is we're now going to uh, start replacing these with uh, real bitmaps inside of Photoshop. OK, so inside of Photoshop, here is uh, that template that I showed you before from the front. And I just named this front.psd. And I set up a couple of groups here. And the first group is the where group. So I uh, will show you what this is. So inside of this where group, everything we paint in here, anything that's white is going to keep the paint as it is. And anything that's black is going to take paint away. So what I did was I just added a little bit of a blotch here um, with a, uh, a grunge brush. In fact, let me just uh, make it a bit bigger so it's more obvious. And I just painted uh, this little area black. And so what that's going to do is that's going to remove paint from the final 3D image. And I also underneath have this other layer. And this is just adding sort of random scratches onto the surface. I made this uh, scratch pattern by uh, getting a scratch board, um, which is this uh, piece of paper that has a black ink on it. And then I just scratched it, uh, the surface, uh, revealing the uh, white paint underneath. And I scanned it and inverted it and used that as a scratch map. It's a lot of fun to, to make your own scratch maps that way. So anyway, uh, now that I have this, I'm going to save this image out. 
Now back in Max here, um, I just noticed that this area here actually should be uh, painted metal as well. So let me just take that one object and assign this material. And we'll re render this. There you go. So what I'm going to do now um, is I'm going to, let me just stop that render. In this mask here um, that I showed you before, under front texture, I'm going to replace this test mask with the mask that I just painted in Photoshop. And the name of that is front underscore wear of PNG. And that's what it looks like here. And now we hit render. And you can see the spots that I painted black are now gone. All the uh, uh, paint is gone and it reveals the, uh, the, the metal underneath. So, and you'll also note that the curvature stuff that I had before is also inside of here, layered on top. So the idea is to use the curvature procedural shader to remove just chunks of stuff around the edges. But then if you want to adjust that, if you want to take more of the paint off or adjust the paint, uh, by adding scratches or whatnot, you can do that as well as this. So it's the two stuff layered on top of each other. And you're getting the best of both worlds here, sort of a procedural under base, and then on top you can paint uh, on the details. Okay, now let's do the rust. So for the rust here, I'm going to turn the rust back on. It was zero, but I'm going to turn it to 100. And I'm going to do the same for these other ones here. And now let's go over to Photoshop. And now I have another layer here called Rust, another uh, group called Rust. And inside this group, all I did was I, turn that to normal, is all I did was I got a photograph of some rust that I took uh, and then I um, contrasted it really hard. I turned it black and white and uh, gave it a lot of contrast. So the white areas are areas that are gonna be rust and the black areas are areas that are not going to be rust. And I just set this to the screen here just so I could see where the rust is going to be placed. And I used the clone tool and a number of other things to sort of place chunks of rust in, in different spots. Okay, so let's set that back to normal. Now I'm going to save this bitmap. Come back inside of Max. I'm going to go to the rust mask and go to the front and replace this temporary generic mask with the one I just saved. So this one will be front underscore rust dot PNG. And if you view the image, again, you can see the image we saw inside of Photoshop. And now when I hit render, you can see that it's starting to place rust on the surface. Now, one of the nice things about this technique is, say, all we have here is a rust material with a mask revealing the rust material. So inside the rust material is a bitmaps that look kind of rusty. You can kind of see it here. And then that bitmap is then being revealed by this mask. So let's say that I'm like, you know what? This rust is just too light and I want a darker rust. I can go into here and I can change the darkness of this uh, rust. So let's say I go here uh, under color correction and I make it darker. And then I hit re-render. And now all the rust is looking darker. And so what I'm doing is, is I'm changing materials and by changing the material um, and not where it's being placed, it's really easy to swap out this material with a brand new rust material, a different rust material, uh, make changes to how um, shiny it is or how not shiny it is while not affecting where it's placed. So the thing about this technique is it kind of splits out where stuff is placed and what stuff actually is, which is uh, really helpful to uh, customize your material. Okay, so the last one now is going to be the dirt. So let's go up here to our blend material again and I'll turn on the dirt. And same deal. Uh, as rust, except in this case, uh, what we're going to do is uh, the rust is a mask which is revealing the color of this rust material. 
with the dirt, we're actually going to be applying, we're going to have a different color and also a different mask, both which are going to be painted inside of Photoshop. So let me show you how that works. So over in Photoshop, I have another group here called Dirt. And this one, instead of being a black and white mask that reveals stuff, uh, it's actually going to have transparency in it. And then we're going to use this transparency inside of Max. So let me show you this. Um, I just set up a bunch of sort of subgroups uh, here. And so first of all is a stain, which is just a uh, very soft brush. And I kind of painted um, a slight discoloration around some of these edges. Then this is a splash, and again, this is just using a grunge brush, and I just sort of painted some splashed dirt uh, around various spots on the surface. And notice how this is a different color. This is a darker color than this other color. And that's why this is going to be on transparent, because when it comes to the dirt, I like mixing different colors of dirt together, because it gives it a, a more complex uh, look. So then this is a smudge layer, and um, this was a photograph I took uh, at a gas station. I was pumping gas and I noticed it was a nice sort of grunge on one of the pillars. So I took a photograph of it and uh, then processed it in Photoshop. And Edge is just again another grunge brush where I'm just adding a little bit of detail around these edges. Drips. Uh, this just has a few drips that I placed in various spots where you get drips. Usually it's a seam and then uh, from the seam these like drips will, will come out. So I just manually painted those with a little brush. And then scrapes. I think this was, if I remember right, another image that uh, was a photograph from a gas station. Gas stations have lots of good uh, uh, grungy stuff, so a good place to get photographs. So I, I took the original photograph. I think it was like black smudges on a uh, white background. And then I brought it to Photoshop. I contrasted it. And then I pasted it into here um, on a transparent background. So that makes up all of our dirt layers. So now let me save this one. Now back inside of Max, we're going to have to do two changes here. So the first change is the same as the last one. I go into Dirt Mask, and I go into the front, and then I replace this temporary one with front underscore dirt dot png. There we go. And if we view this image, oh, actually, you know what? I messed up here. So when I saved it, I saved it with the background template in it. I don't actually want to do that. So let me go back here and hide that. And that's what I actually want to save. So let's try resaving that. OK, so now back in Max, I have resaved that dirt. I hit reload. And now let's view the image. Yeah, that looks better. That looks closer to what I would expect. So hide that. And now we add it once here. And what this is going to do is this is going to take the alpha from that image and use it as the mask. But then for the color, instead of the dirt having its own separate color, this also is going to need that map. So I go into the front texture and place this with front underscore dirt dot png. There's our, uh, our image again. OK, now let us do one more render. And there we go. So now that is applying all that dirt. You can see the drips here, the drips from there, from the front, and pasting it onto the surface. So of course, uh, to finish this off, since this is a, a 360 model, you do exactly the same thing, uh, but you now do it from the other um, five sides as well as the front side. So one other note, um, when you're painting these dirt and rust and wear maps, what you'll frequently do is you'll do a test render, and then you'll come back here, and then you'll say, oh, you know, I really want to add a little something here, so you add a little something here. And it gets really tiring uh, to go in and uh, do that again and again and again, and then resave these images all the time. So um, I had someone write a script for me uh, inside of Photoshop. And if you go down in here, uh, the script is called Export Groups to Files. And you can get the script for free on my website in the CG uh, tools area. Just go to the Photoshop area. And what this does is when you run the script, it will take all, every single one of these uh, groups and export them as a separate bitmap. So what it'll do is it'll take this one, it'll save that, then it'll take this one, it'll save that, and then take this one and save that. 
And the way it saves it is it will save it as the name of your file underscore the name of your group. And so the advantage of that is once I make a bunch of changes to here, rather than having to manually save these out all the time, I just go to scripts, I run this one thing, and it saves all three of these for me. And then when I go into uh, back into Max, it's reloaded them all, and then I can hit render and see what the results are. So it's just a, a better way for automating this uh, particular saving process. And here we are again, uh, back showing off the final results. So this, uh, like a cooking show, I uh, did a version earlier so that I could show what the results are, and then I um, showed you how it's done, and now here we are back to the results. So you can see all the different details in here. You have the materials, which are really fast to assign, and then you have the, uh, the broken out bits of uh, the paintware, which is procedural. You have some manual area here that I manually painted um, uh, to remove some of the paint, and then you have the rust and the dirt. Now, as far as the amount of dirt on this face, I probably went a little bit overboard. If I was doing this for a real production model, I'd probably be a little more subtle with my dirt than what I did here. But this is a tutorial showing off how to paint uh, you know, dirt and uh, materials on a surface. So I went a little bit further just so that um, um, you can see what I'm doing. So again, the advantages of this technique are there are no UVs required. So when you have that uh, 2000 object uh, robot or whatever, you don't have to UV any of it. Uh, it works great with tons of objects. Um, it's really easy to swap out materials. So again, um, if you'd sort of painted this uh, separately, it would be difficult to say change all of this chrome to a different kind of chrome, or it would be difficult to change all the rust to a different kind of rust. But because this is uh, set up as this layering of materials, it makes it really easy. Uh, you paint specific details in Photoshop where you need them, and you let the procedural stuff handle the, the more general details uh, when you don't need something specific on there. Um, the Sal uh, tool that I showed you is very Keyshot-like, uh, which allows you to swap materials really quickly and experiment with lots of looks. And the results are full 3D, so that if you are doing this as a concept design instead of making your final asset, and you need to show multiple angles, it's really easy to do that without having to repaint the dirt again and again and again. So I always end this talk with a 3ds Max wish list, and what this is, is these are wishes that if we had these things, it would make this technique a lot faster. And one thing that's been really cool is every time I do this talk, this list gets smaller and smaller. So a big thank you to all the people who've been writing software to help make this uh, a much easier process. So especially uh, with the most recent 2017 release, we now have blended box maps and blended cube projections and uh, curvature built into Max. So we basically have two things left. Uh, number one would be an improved color correction map. Uh, the color correction map we have inside of Max uh, really needs a lot of work. And uh, if we had a better color correction map, it would make it a lot easier to do a lot of the color corrections inside of the, these various materials. And then the last one is grouping nodes in the slate material editor. And so let me just show you what I mean. So this is the, um, uh, I turned off the classic material editor and this is the slate material editor, which is the schematic one. And if you look at uh, this material, which is our um, combo material, you can see that there's a lot of nodes inside of here. And so you saw me when I was changing things, I have to like go, okay, I go for this one, go to this one, go to this one. I'm picking through all these nodes and changing all these various parameters. If we could have a way to group this stuff, so say like this entire section here all deals with the dirt. So if I could group all these into a single node, and then that node had uh, parameters, the parameters that are inside of here are up at the, at the node, uh, the group level. I could go into that group and I could change everything that deals with dirt or rust or whatever in one spot, rather than having to hunt and pick through all these separate nodes. So that would make uh, this way, way easier if we had the, the grouping ability. So um, all of you out there, if you're uh, watching this and you think that's a really good idea, please uh, find ways to uh, persuade uh, Autodesk and the other companies to add the sort of, these sorts of features inside of Max. Um, you know, bug them, poke them, offer them beer, offer them free dinners, whatever it takes to get some of these features in there. And hopefully one day I'll be able to do one last version of this uh, tutorial and have no wish list at the end. Okay, so thank you for watching. I hope you found this talk interesting. Uh, please try this technique on your own models, and if you do, please send me some pictures. I always love seeing them. Uh, visit my website, neilblevins.com, uh, for more tutorials on various art-related subjects. And also feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want to be notified uh, when I post new videos uh, about art-related stuff. So thank you very much. Have a good day.